I'm going to read our passage before we jump into it, um, but it's helpful for us just to remember, whenever we open the scriptures, the living God is about to speak to us. He has something to say to us. Um, so let's sit, listen, uh, and hear. All right, 1 Corinthians 3, if you've got your Bible there, um, grab it open. Let me read it out for us. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul, and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role God has given them. I planted Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. So then, Neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God gives the growth. Now he who plants and he who waters are one, and each will receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder, and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss, but he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool so that he can become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness with God. Since it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, The Lord knows that the reasonings of the wise are futile. So let no one boast in human leaders, for everything is yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or things present or things to come, everything is yours and you belong to Christ and Christ belongs to God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your words to us today. Your word is truth. Sanctify us, Lord, now through your word. Father, for those of us who need to be taught, be teaching us this morning. For those of us who need to be rebuked, be rebuking us this morning. For those of us who need comfort. For those of us who need the sweet solace of the gospel. Father, please be speaking into our hearts. Be shaping us by your spirit so that we can live lives that honour and glorify you. We pray this, Father, uh, in your Son's name. Amen. Well, I work on campus with a Christian group called Evangelical Students, uh, and one of our core values uh, is that we are the mission arm of the local church on campus. Uh, As we all leave here today, uh, we will all go into places God has called us to be, Uh, work, family, communities that you're a part of. And some of you who are university students will go on to be witnesses on campus because that is where God has placed you. And that's where ES kicks in. Uh, What we are trying to do as an organisation is help uh, students think through what it means to be a witness to Jesus on campus. Uh, And hopefully then they'll be able to then take this uh, for the rest of their lives. And so one of the things that I get to think about a bit is how someone becomes a Christian. And one of the interesting things that we are wrestling with at the moment 
is that the process for how someone becomes a Christian has changed over time. Not the fundamentals, it's okay. It's all about Jesus, repentance and faith. But it's more just that the process just takes a bit longer now. Uh, Rico Tice uh, is an evangelist in England. He wrote a great little book on evangelism called Honest Evangelism. Uh, And he describes the process this way. He he talks about the fact that when Billy Graham, the great evangelist of the 20th century, was doing evangelistic rallies, the people who he was talking to and asking to respond were largely actually sympathetic towards Christianity. He'd call people to faith and they would come in incredible numbers. But did you know that in Australia, at the Billy Graham Crusades in the 50s and 60s, 90% of all people who gave their life to Jesus were already in an existing church. They were already there. They had the framework. They understood what was going on. And so when Billy Graham got up and said, repent and believe, they said, yeah, I need to do that. Rico then compares it to when he started his work in 1994. Things had changed. Instead of sort of an understanding and a sympathy, there was now just a deep suspicion towards Christianity. In fact, he talks about three sort of hurdles that stood in the way. Christianity was now weird, untrue, and irrelevant. So the process for someone becoming a Christian became longer because people had to jump over those three hurdles before they could then engage with the gospel message. But fast forward 30 years and it's changed again. Because now, and particularly the younger that you get, the younger generations, people are just not even on that same line. Most secular Australians are sort of down off that line facing in the opposite direction. There is no concept of Christianity. They don't really even know enough to actually argue that it's weird, untrue or irrelevant. Christianity just isn't really in their consciousness. Which means that the process now is just getting longer and longer. Uh, In fact, we did some internal research, which I think marries with other research that is out there, and it suggests that it now takes some time from, sorry, sorry, the time it takes from hearing the gospel for the first time to becoming a Christian, how long do you reckon it would take? From hearing the gospel to becoming a Christian, what do you reckon? Six Six months, two years? No, all the research shows five plus years it takes. I heard someone else talking about this the other day, they talked about 50 deep conversations. Now, I'm not saying this is good or bad, I'm just observing this as a sociological trend. Uh, But what this means, uh, I think there's two things that this means. The first for us on campus uh, means that campus ministry is probably going to look pretty different. If it takes five plus years for someone to become a Christian, we usually have students for about three to four years, which probably means we're not going to see the same amount of people coming to Jesus as we once did. But that's okay because, as I said, we are the mission arm of the local church. Which brings me to my second point, and the point that I really want us to hear this morning. More importantly, and why we're talking about this now, is that this means that the local church is as important as ever to the mission of the church. Now, it has always been important, but there are particular reasons why, in this cultural moment, we need to lean into this truth. Because to move someone from a complete lack of consciousness of the gospel to turn them around, to jump them up back onto that next line, to get over those hurdles, jump over one, two, three, so then they can get to a point where they can hear the gospel clearly and respond, it's just going to take time. But more than that, because what I've described actually is a highly rationalised, high-level process. But of course, we all know that life is not like that. We like to think that we're rational, but we're not. What we are are messy people. Influenced by those around us, we're embodied, we're emotional, we're deeply relationally driven. And so how does someone actually move during those five years? Well, they need to belong to a cross-shaped community of believers that is living the gospel out week by week, day by day, hour by hour. In short, they need to be part of a church that is united in Jesus, whose foundation is Jesus, and who is seeking to please and honour Jesus as his temple here on this earth. Now you might think, well that's a terrible idea. Who would entrust the mission to the church? We're a broken, divided, sinful people. Yes, it's true. 
But when seen through the eyes of the cross, we see that this messy, often useless group of people is actually God's precious temple. Which means that there is no more urgent need for us here in Adelaide for the gospel to go forward than for us to have mature, unified churches whose foundation is Jesus, where people can come, be a part of that community to learn, to know and to understand that Jesus is their Lord and Saviour. Well, keep your Bibles open. We're going to jump into the text, uh, 1 Corinthians 3. Uh, And what we get here at this point uh, is Paul sort of introducing the pastoral problem uh, that he's about to deal with. Uh, Have a look with me again at verse 1. For my part, brothers and sisters, I was not able to speak to you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as babies in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, since you were not ready for it yet. In fact, you are still not ready because you are still worldly. For since there is envy and strife among you, are you not worldly and behaving like mere humans? For whenever someone says, I belong to Paul and another, I belong to Apollos, are you not acting like mere humans? What's the problem here? Well, the problem is that the Corinthians are not united. They are divided. It seems that the division is around the different leaders and preachers who have been serving the church. The church is divided into factions and they are quarrelling. Now, I said Paul is introducing the problem, but you probably realise that we've actually been here before. Because actually, Paul is sort of picking up the argument that he began in chapter 1. Paul there introduces the same problem, but just when you think that Paul is going to fix the problem, it's as though he sort of bounces off the pastoral problem and begins to talk about theology. But this isn't actually a mistake. Because Paul sort of essentially pauses his pastoral argument to establish his theological principle. Before he can solve the division problem, he needs them to understand the difference between the wisdom of the world and the wisdom of the cross. That's what he does for the rest of chapter 1 and into chapter 2. That's important for us because what Paul is about to do in our passage is to take his theological principle and then apply it to the pastoral situation. To put it another way, in order to deal with the action of division... Paul needs to fix the belief that lies behind the division. They are spiritual babies. He needs them to grow up a bit. Now, two things you should know about me. The first, you heard before, I've got three small kids, four, three, and one. Uh, Number two, I also have an oven. Which means I spend a significant amount of time thinking about the intersection between small children and ovens. Some of the parents here are with me. Occasionally, this yields an insight. My one-year-old, Will, knows that he shouldn't touch the oven, mostly because of the commotion that ensues when he tries and the fact that he's never been allowed to. But he continues to try and touch the hot oven. It doesn't really matter how many times we tell him, he will continue to try to get to that oven, laughing maniacally in every attempt. My four-year-old, on the other hand, is a very mature, intelligent little girl. But she has figured out the why behind the command. She has a belief, a mindset that tells her that hot things will burn her, therefore she doesn't touch the oven. Her belief has led to a change in her actions. When my son sees the oven, he sees fun and chaos. He is foolish. Now he's just a baby, isn't he? He can't understand the why behind it. When my daughter sees the oven, she appropriately sees the danger. That is wisdom. She has matured. And that is what Paul is trying to do here. The wisdom of the world is leading to division. So to move from division to unity, Paul needs to move them from worldly wisdom to the wisdom of the cross. From a baby understanding to a mature understanding. To put it another way, they need to stop viewing the world through worldly lenses and start viewing themselves as they really are, through cross-shaped lenses. So let's see how Paul then applies the wisdom of the cross to the division problem. And to show that factional quarrelling is foolishness and that unity is wisdom, Paul uses three metaphors, three pictures that demonstrate the wisdom of the cross. The first is of the faithful farmer. Have a look at verse 5 and 6. What then is Apollos? What is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. 
The metaphor here is pretty simple, isn't it? Paul Apollos, any of the other leaders, are simply farmhands. They are doing the work that is allotted to them. With a hot sun on their backs, Paul is walking up and down the furrows, planting the seed. Apollos is coming along behind, watering the seed. Both of them are laboring in God's field. Notice each of them are doing different things, but notice also that they are interdependent. You need both seed and water. Paul then draws out two implications out of this metaphor. Verse, firstly, verse 7. So then, neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who gives the growth. While Paul and Apollos are doing important work, at the end of the day, it is God's field. It is God who is doing the work. When we take off our worldly lenses that only see the physical realities and we put on our cross-shaped lenses, we see the spiritual reality behind it. Paul and Apollos might be doing the physical work of planting and watering, but behind it, God is the one who is at work. Paul and Apollos, then, are completely replaceable. Could be Paul and Apollos doing the work. Could be Barry, it could be Harold. Could be Trey, it could be Don, it could be Lucy. But do you see that Christian leadership in Christian communities has an inbuilt humility virtue? The leader, the planter, the waterer are not anything. It is God who brings the growth, which means that all are fundamentally equal before God because the leader is not anything. But secondly, this equality then is the basis for unity. Have a look at verse 8. Now he who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his own reward according to his own labour. For we are God's co-workers. You are God's field, God's building. Given that it is God's work, God's field, that is God who brings the growth, there is a profound unity that must exist. It would be absurd, of course, for the planter to turn around to the waterer and say, I don't need you. More absurd for the waterer to develop a faction around him to elevate himself above the planter for both of them to be standing there quarrelling in the middle of the field. They are both, of course, working the same field. They are tending the same seeds. But moreover, neither of them is essential to the task. They are both expendable. God could use whoever he wants. Except, of course, that God has chosen them. God has chosen both the planter and the water to be his co-workers. He has given them the work, which means that however you skin this, on any level... Factional quarrelling is absurd. Paul is saying to the Corinthians, a community shaped by the cross, that is living out the cross, will be equal and united. Equal because everyone is expendable, united in the task that they have been given and chosen for by God. A quarrelling church is a contradiction. It doesn't make any sense. So that's metaphor number one, God's field. We now move to God's building, the wise builder, verse 10. According to God's grace that was given to me, I have laid a foundation as a skilled master builder and another builds on it. But each one is to be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay any foundation other than what has been laid down. And that foundation is Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul, in this metaphor, moves from being a farmhand to being a master builder. As a master builder, he has laid the foundation. But what is the foundation? Well, that foundation is simply Jesus. Paul has not done anything fancy or impressive. He's just proclaimed Jesus. And as the next builder has come along, they have simply built upon Jesus. That is, they continue to lay down Jesus. Notice the equality that we've seen. No builder is greater than the one before or after. And notice the unity. They are all doing the same task. But this metaphor adds something else into the mix as well. It talks about the content of the building. What the Corinthian church should be centred around. And that foundation is Jesus. Paul drives this point home here in verses 12 to 15. If anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, each one's work will become obvious. For the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire. The fire will test the quality of each one's work. If anyone's work that he has built survives, he will receive a reward. 
If anyone's work is burned up, he will experience loss. But he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. You see, Paul, Apollos, Peter, their job is to build the church. And they build the church by building in line with the foundation. If your work is building on Jesus, then it's going to survive the final test. If you have built something other than Jesus, then it will be burnt and wasted. There's a warning here, isn't there, for leaders, but for all of us as well. There is only one secure foundation, and that foundation is Jesus. For the leaders, there is only one person that your people need, and it is not you. It is Jesus. For the congregation, there is only one type of pastor that you need, and it's not the fancy one, it's not the gun preacher one, it's the one who points you towards Jesus. And there is only one reward that will matter, one opinion that matters for all of us. And it is not the praise of other people, it is the judgment of Jesus when he returns and tests your work. Do you see how this cuts against Corinthians' factional fighting? Because presumably what was feeding the factions was the leader, the builder, who was receiving the praise and adulation from those he was pleasing. It's easy to see how toxic this can become. A leader saying something, receiving praise, getting good feedback, and so saying more of the same thing in order to get that good response. And so this feedback loop is created, but this feedback loop surely and slowly but surely is moving away from the foundation that is Jesus. But take off your worldly glasses and put on your cross-shaped glasses and what do you see? Well, you see that the return of Jesus is real. And he will burn up anything that is not his. The only work that matters is that which is in line with Jesus. The only reward that matters is the reward that Jesus will give. The only security that we can have is by building on Jesus. Jesus must be the center of the church. We get then to the third metaphor. And this third metaphor really sort of ties it all together for us. A worldly church is marred by infighting and quarrelling. A cross-shaped church is unified because its foundation is Jesus. Now, why does this matter? Why does Paul care so much? Because to the Corinthians with worldly wisdom, they were like just some any other group. A messy, inward-looking group. Each person trying to get above the other to please God, to receive praise, to be on the right factional team. But that's not what Paul sees. And it's not what they should see when they look through cross-shaped glasses. And Paul wants to change their behaviour by changing how they see themselves. Because if they believe the truth about themselves, then they will begin to behave like it. If they understand who they really are, their true identity, then factional quarrelling will be replaced by a beautiful unity centred on Jesus. So what does Paul see? When he looks at the Corinthian church, what does he see when he looks at them? What is he so desperate for them to see about themselves? Well, have a look at verse 16. Don't you yourselves know that you are God's temple and that the Spirit of God lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and that is what you are. The Corinthian church is messy and broken and divided as it looks from a worldly perspective. Because it has been sanctified by Jesus, set apart is something else entirely when seen through the lens of the cross. It's an extraordinary thing to say. Particularly as you continue to go through 1 Corinthians and that picture of just how broken this church is begins to build up. In the Corinthian church, you get the messy detail of what a real life church full of sinners looks like. And yet, none of this takes away from the fact that it is God's church. It is God's temple. It is holy. It is set apart as God's people to witness to Jesus. This is who they are when they look at themselves with cross-shaped glasses. And this is why it's important. 
Because we're not talking about any old social gathering. We're talking about something that is profoundly spiritual, the temple of God. Think about that temple imagery for a moment. This is the place where those searching for God can come and find the forgiveness of their sins. A place where they can be integrated into a church where they can feel and know that love of God. A place that is not perfect but is being perfected as we grow into our identity as the temple of God. Is this what you see when you look at the church here? Is this the story that you tell about city life? I hope so. Because our city desperately needs churches full of people who love their church because they see it through cross-shaped lenses. And the more they believe their true identity is the temple of God, the more they will begin to act like it. And that is such a beautiful and important thing. So what do we need to see for us here today? Firstly, no more factional quarrelling. Now, I'll grant you that's a little bit weird for a guest preacher to come in at this point and make that point. Because actually I don't really know what's going on here. I promise I've been given no inside information about what's happening. Yet we need to land here because Paul lands it here. In verses 18 to 20, he reiterates the theological principle and then in verse 21, he applies it directly. So then, after all of this, he comes back, verse 20, so then, no more boasting about human leaders. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours and you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Now, My educated guess is that this is not a problem that you guys have that is on par with the Corinthian church. And yet we all have this tendency in us, don't we? You'd be a strange church if you didn't. Here's a couple of ways that I think it can kind of come out of us a little bit. Do you have a favourite preacher? Are you a little bit disappointed when it's someone else preaching? We all do it, don't we? But you need at that moment when you start having those thoughts to put on your cross-shaped glasses. Both when you're listening to your favourite preacher to remind you that they are not in fact anything. They are completely replaceable. But you also need those cross-shaped glasses when you listen to your least favourite preacher. The one you don't connect with. Because that person is doing the job appointed to him by God. And it is God, not the preacher's rhetoric or skill or personality, who will bring the growth in you. Here's another way I think we do it. Why do you love your church? Is it because it's got a great community or because the preaching is excellent or because the worship is powerful? Do you see the problem when we think like that? Because that's essentially worldly wisdom that is setting us up for failure. When there's conflict in the church, when the preacher moves on and someone else less gifted takes their place, when you're tired and dried and the worship experience just isn't hitting the mark, We need to see our churches through cross-shaped lenses. Because what are we looking for? Does your church have Jesus as its foundation? Are you united around that? And are you striving to live up to your real identity as the temple of God? Because that's what counts. And that will also be what helps you endure when times get tough. But finally... And to finish, just to zoom out a little bit, we began today by talking about the changes and challenges to evangelism that we have now. But what we need actually is not something new. What we need is something old. Jesus entrusted his mission to his church. This hasn't changed. The biggest gospel need that we have in Adelaide is to have lots and lots of faithful, cross-shaped churches that are noticeably different because we are seeing and we are acting based on the wisdom of the cross and not the wisdom of the world. We've seen here how it applies to factional quarrelling and as you continue through this book, you will see Paul apply the wisdom of the cross again and again in situation after situation because we need churches that are cross-shaped because for people to know Jesus, the best place for them to do it is in the context of the local church. 
to be experiencing this cross-shaped love, to be surprised and attracted to the cross-shaped hope, to be in a place whose foundation is Jesus. Brothers and sisters, there are so many people out there who do not know Jesus. There are so many people out there in Adelaide who are in darkness and need to be moved from darkness into the kingdom of his son, Jesus. And what is the evangelistic tool? What is the thing that God has given us in order to be able to do that? He has given us the church. And the great need that we have is for us to be growing into our identity as the temple, the temple of God, the place where people can come and find the forgiveness of sins, a place where, hear these words again, all things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Can I pray for you? Let me pray. Father, I want to thank you so much for the saints that you have here at City Life. Thank you for this church. And I pray for us this morning. I pray for myself. I pray for all of us that you'll be helping us to understand what a theology of the cross means for us, that we would see this world through cross-shaped wisdom. Father, take out from us any factional quarrelling, any of those tendencies that we have to raise people up, to tear others down. Instead, Father, be giving us that unity based on the foundation of Jesus. And Father, I pray that you would help this church be a light to this world, that it will be a place where people can come and can experience the love of Jesus, to know it in the people who they interact with as the word is preached, as the Spirit does his work amongst our hearts. And so, Father, please be doing that. And Father, as we move now uh, into a time of communion as well, uh, what a beautiful picture and image of the unity that you have given us. Father, help us to know that and to experience that unity based on Jesus now. And we pray this, Father, in your son's name. Amen.